Welcome to the Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday afternoon edition, the calm before the storm. Oh, man, I really should have done my hair up today and razor or shave or something. Anyway, hope you all did well. It was a, a great day for anybody who was bullish. Thank you, Janet Yellen. Uh, as you guys know, I am, I'm loving playing with the, I guess, AI generation of graphic images. And I know the podcasters can't hear me so or can't see me. So sorry for Big Ed, Big, uh, sorry, Ed up in San Jose. If you look at the graphics here today, though, I tried to say, like, Janet Yellen's saving the day, and this is what came up. I love it. It put Janet Yellen in, like, a superhero costume, and this is the one that I chose for today, but there was actually a, a close runner-up, and that was this graphic right here, uh, Yellen to the rescue. So pretty much the same topic for, for both of the pictures, but I like this one better. It looks a little more nerdy superhero behind the, or in front of the columns of some government building. Anyway, uh, as the soap opera for the financial markets continues on, Janet Yellen, of course, as you guys may have heard today, said, listen, we are going to backstop smaller banks because she was grilled, as I mentioned, I believe it was from Oklahoma. Uh, Senator from Oklahoma was just ripping her to pieces on how the Fed, FDIC, and other regulators are backing up the big banks, right? Helping out the JP Morgans, even things like Silicon Valley Bank. But the little regionals, not going to get any love. So I thought it was... Uh, a nice statement from her and of course the market's rejoicing in that so i'm going to start things off there and then we'll go into the actions that the treasury can do since she's the secretary of the treasury what can she actually do but let's start off with our top seven work our way from the bottom to the top given the fact that there was even more reassurance from politicians and regulators and uh, all the different agencies that they're going to put more money into the market currency or gold silver did not do well today and we mentioned that $2,000 target on gold a while back. We hit 2,000, came into overhead supply level, which goes slightly further back to right here, going back into the 18th of April of last year. Hit that, and then yesterday ended with kind of a shooting star formation after a nice rally. Talked about a nice potential short on that one, and today gold really taking it down quite a bit. 1943 is where it closed, down 1.97% on the day, making it by far your worst performer, at least for our top seven market indexes. Dow, 1.01% gain. And I guess the good news here for anybody who's looking for a breakout trade is if we were to wrap the yellow box kind of around the range that the Dow has been stuck in, I, I like to use the, the real body, so we'll just call the, the the breakout range. We broke out above it today looking great. Nice move, 1.01% as I mentioned. And once it broke above that 32,534 mark, it looked like smooth sailing. Now, for those who are students of OTA, you are coming into an area of supply kind of at this moment. So we'll see if this one actually holds the stronger levels, certainly further up around 33,400. All right, I don't trade the Dow. Too many, too few components in that index for me to even care about it. So I'll move on. Bitcoin, yay, continuing on. I saw this little, um, what do they call a spinning top doji yesterday? And I was like, uh-oh, that's usually a nice reversal sign. Today, not only did we not get a reversal, we actually moved up another 1.07%. Closing at 28,245 on Bitcoin, which is great. The more time we hesitate without really having a pullback in this move, the better. You know, a lot of people were looking at this, expecting there to be a pullback because of this most recent surge. And if that was true, you know, your logical targets become Bitcoin falling back to about 25,200. You've got another potential target uh, right around 23,000, just off of FIB retracements from the most current move. So good news that it's holding there. Um, had that same Bitcoin thought yesterday. Yeah, me too, Lisa. I still kept mine though. Uh, the only thing I'm doing with Bitcoin is I'm buying every Wednesday. I buy more Bitcoin. So uh, good news for me as this thing continues to rise. So that was your fifth place. Fourth place, we go to the S&P 500. Great move today of 1.41%, closing at 4,039. And you can see here also coming right into this previous area where it had that last shooting star and a nice move down. We actually talked about this, this specific Monday on how that shooting star could present a good shorting opportunity. Well, now you're coming back into that supply level. So keep your eye on this zone on the S&P, which is going to be between 4047 and 4082. And that's loosely drawn, of course. Uh, let's see, number three on our list, going to the bronze medal. That's NASDAQ. NASDAQ 100 was up 1.47%. You know, yesterday we had, uh, two days ago actually, we had this kind of Harami formation, which almost felt like we were going to start to roll over. Yesterday started to roll over, but then gained right back to kind of neutral for the day. Today breaking out to the upside. So it looks, even, I have to agree with Jim Cramer on this one. I know, I can't believe it. I have to zoom in on camera. 
I agree with Jim Cramer. Ugh, it pains me to say it. Um, you know, it's, don't fight the NASDAQ right now. It's the strongest of our four indexes right now, challenging these overhead highs, not only at the current level, but you can see it also goes back to this high from the 7th, 13th of September of last year. Uh, from that, you know, 13,000, just a sniff above it there. So we're real close to a, a nice breakout here, which means the NASDAQ could really start challenging those highs that we saw going all the way back into August of last year, which we put around 13,700. That's almost 900 points uh, above current valuation, which just would be a pretty great move. I think it'd be right around oh, 900 points, be what is gonna be about 7% uh, higher. So there's definitely that potential there for this one to break out if it continues on up. Some of these tech stocks have been certainly beaten down. And of course, the bailout means more money for tech, which is usually loan heavy. So that was your third place. Second place, the Russell. Nope, no follow through to the downside on yesterday's break. Remember, we broke the uh, flag formation to the south side and then came right back up. So not a good sign. We like to have seen a close below 1732, but it did not close below there. So that was uh, kind of negating this formation, which I will now remove because in my book, this bear pennant formation is erased. Um, I know some people might still keep it there, but nice big bullish move today, giving it the silver medal at 1.85% gain for the Russell 2000. And lastly, here is crude oil ripping back up. $69.49 uh, is the current price for crude oil, up 2.46%. Now, logically, the, the next most attractive target is going to be coming back up to the lower end where it broke out of this zone or this channel, which is going to put it right around $70.44. So another buck up from here before you start to see potential uh, sell-off going down there. All right, um, let's see. <laughs> So that's my top seven. Let me real quickly look at the dollar index, which was drifting slightly lower today, so no big deal there. There is a, an issue that I have with this one right here. So here's our 10-year. You guys can see that obviously from March 2nd of this year through just a couple days ago, the 10-year dropping in yield significantly. We're almost at 4.1%, dropped all the way back down to 3.3%. Uh, that is a massive decline in yields in a very short period of time, but now all of a sudden started to pop up a little bit. So let's go back to this graphic here. Yelling to the rescue. Now get your hands ready. I always like when you guys participate and type and, and I'll try to read through all the, the results here. But if Janet Yellen, who represents the treasury, and of course that's just an arm of the government, says we're going to back up all these banks, we're going to make depositors whole. There was one little caveat, I have to make sure I get that in here, it was an asterisk, if you will, that said banks that pose a systemic risk. So what I think the industry did is the industry reacted like Yellen's going to backstop every bank every bank that's not true if there is a systemic risk and i make again i mentioned this one yesterday if i'm at uh you know merlin's saving or merlin's merlin's bank here in, in southern california and i'm only you know i've got 20 million dollars worth of assets i am by no means a systemic risk however things like silicon valley bank which had 220 billion dollar market valuation that could be more of a systemic risk now a lot of the banks that were getting bailed out tended to have very wealthy depositors. If you look at First Republic, that was those are wealthy depositors, right? Those are, uh, from the numbers I read, a lot of coastal cities, a lot of very wealthy people kept their money there. So, of course, you bail out First Republic because you don't want to piss off the rich people. But if, let's say I'm a working class bank, I'm Merlin's Bank here in Southern California, and my average, cut, let's say my average customer has, you know, $50,000 in it, and I got, you know, maybe 30, 40,000 customers, I'm probably not going to get that benefit from Jen Yellen. Now, certainly, my depositors are already protected under FDIC, but you know, if I'm just kind of an average run-of-the-mill, nobody really important in my bank, I don't expect to see any uh, government protection there. So here's where I want your participation. <clears throat> we already are in a situation where First Republic received $30 billion. And by the way, let's look at First Republic today because it soared. Here's FRC. First Republic Bank was up 29% today, down another 5% in the after hour session. But First Republic, during this drop right here, had $70 billion worth of outflows. That just gives you an idea of how much money was sitting there. And realistically, that wasn't because people necessarily wanted their money. It's because people wanted to make sure their money was safe. So anybody who had over $250,000 in cash would pull that money out, move it to another bank that might not be in trouble. And that, that's why you saw such big outflows. The good news is, from the reports I'm reading, the net outflows have d pretty much not ceased, but they've slowed down dramatically. So this big initial bank run that was going on because of Silicon Valley Bank, and then you could argue Signature, and um, and uh, what was the other one? Um, 
Silvergate, that initial surge of withdrawals of get my money out has subsided substantially, which is great for anybody who's thinking this could continue to be a, uh, you know, a big fear pandemic, uh, market pandemic, financial pandemic, if you will, and just start to crash the markets even more. So if Janet Yellen is going to go and today she was speaking in front of a bunch of bankers and make the statement that we will backstop regional banks. In your mind, you've got to think that now this becomes a blank check, right? It's almost like the government is now a SPAC and they can just do whatever they want. How is Janet Yellen going to get this money? I guess the, the bigger question is, how is Janet Yellen and the Treasury Department going to acquire these funds in order to potentially pay off banks if there is a major run, if there's a financial situation that happens? How does Janet Yellen raise this money? So let's say going forward, you've got other regional banks go under. You've got Zion, you've got um, um, PAC, PAC W, you've got um, Western Alliance, right? These some regional banks like that. If they start to go under and all of a sudden you see contagion and these banks start to implode, money's being pulled from somewhere. What happens? How does this happen? And there's a longer term, there's a, there was a, a result to my questioning this and asking you guys these details, but why, how would Jenny Ellen raise that capital? Now, we're pretty sure she would just hit a button and that money would automatically be there, but they're gonna ha that now counts as debt, right? Money printer, brrr, right? There you go. California says sell bonds, um, fabricate out of nothing, i.e. print, Liz. So Liz is correct, right? They'll, they'll just say, how much you need? Okay, we have it. Wouldn't that be so nice, guys? Wouldn't it be nice to just walk down to the store knowing you've got like 50 bucks in your checking account and you're like, hey, uh, how much for the Lambo? Oh, 250,000? Yeah, I got that. Boom, there you go, got it. That's essentially what the treasury can do. Now, of course, it goes on their books as debt. So now what do they have to do? They have to go and figure out how to pay that debt. So let me keep reading through here. Um, Lisa, Lisa says, by the way, on printing press, yep. Silicon Valley Bank loans to insiders tripled 209 million before it failed. Crazy. Ugh, just, just nuts the way that all, uh, that all works out. Let's see. Um, Merle, what software are you using for your new graphics? It's called uh, Mid Journey. And then Rajesh says, by holding the security. So what would happen here is obviously the, the treasury gets their, their money from taxes, right? So income taxes, sales taxes, corporate taxes, all that type of stuff. Plus they make money from things like um, national parks, right? You get income from national parks. But another way that they raise capital is to sell bonds, which is what was mentioned here earlier is, is you know, you, you start selling more bonds as California said. So just the only reason I bring that up is I want you to think about the long-term effects of this. If in fact the financial system does face further strain, and I am starting to think that it's not going to, but we're gonna to get to that in a second. If it does face further strain or other runs on banks and we see some defaults happen and they set, start to rush in there, you will see the creation of new bond product, not new bond products, but the sale of new bonds. So maybe they start selling some more 10 years out there. Maybe they start selling some more shorter term bonds, but they're gonna start selling bonds to raise capital. And really that's what the US does, the Treasury Department does to pay off the debt that we owe, right? The interest on our on our debt, raise, sell bonds, raise capital so we can pay the interest on it. But let's just assume that there's an increase and I'm just hypothetically speaking here, but let's say that the, we really go, go to hell in a handbasket. And now the treasury has to find ways to get some money and they start selling bonds. And let's just assume it's that 10 year bond. If they start selling a lot of 10 year bonds to the public and to global entities in order to raise capital, what happens to the price of bonds? <clears throat> it's all part of that opening up the watch and seeing one piece leads to another. If the treasury starts unloading, let's say they increase the sale of bonds by 10%. So they're selling now 10% more than they used to. What will probably happen is keep all things equal, the, the price of those bonds would drop by 10% and the yields would start to increase as well. So the more that that treasury is going to sell to raise capital, the more they're gonna have to entice people to buy them because they're flooding the market with supply. So what happens is yields are going to rise, bonds are go the price of those bonds are going to fall. Now that flies in the face of this. Let's go to TLT. So if you look at this chart here, this is TLT, which represents the 20 year uh, treasuries. If they, let's say, start just selling a bunch of 20-year treasuries to raise capital, the price of this is going to go down. So you may see that TLT start to go lower, and right now it's 105. You know, maybe it gets to 100 or 92 or somewhere, you know, it's going to start to tank if more bonds are sold. On the flip side of that, the yields would rise. And, of course, we've been watching that 10-year, and it's looked great recently. Here is the 10-year. 
because it hasn't been making new highs. Now, we had today a really good number come out with existing home sales. I don't know if you guys saw that, but existing home sales in the United States was supposed to go from 4 million to 4.19 million. We came out at 4.58 million, which that's a significant increase. Now, why? Well, because 30-year fixed rate mortgages just a month or a, a couple weeks ago were significantly higher and those yields have been falling for a while. So you are getting better prices if you're locking in a 30-year fixed rate mortgage than you did a couple weeks ago. So that helps that number dramatically. However, if that Treasury Department starts unloading and creating and selling some new bonds to raise capital to pay for all this, expect these yields to start to creep back up here. <laughs> Uh, let's see, without going into conspiracy, how does this tie into the Fed? Um, well, I don't know if I would call it, DK, I don't know if I would call this a conspiracy. I, I, I have to say, I'm in my gut, my heart tells me that it is a foregone conclusion that at some point, our government will be operating off a central bank digital currency, a CBDC. Why? It's faster. It's more efficient. It's far more traceable and it's way more control for centralized entities, meaning the government. If you, again, and I wish I had all these numbers here. If I had a researcher, I'd be like, hey, can you do me a favor? Go and find out how much it costs to print, protect, store, transfer, destroy, and dispose of currency. Right? You have treasuries all over the, or mints all over the United States that are responsible for security and hiring employees and infrastructure and buildings and all of the things that we think about money. You know, when I, when I open up my wallet and I pull out a $20 bill, our brain just go, oh, it's $20. It probably costs, I don't know, five, six bucks per $20 bill just to protect a $20 bill. I mean, it seems like there's so much back end energy consumption usage for the buildings of all these things. It's huge. So what will happen is, from a government perspective, they spend so much money designing, protecting, storing, printing, transferring, all of that stuff. That all goes away if you use a central bank digital currency. There's no need for a giant building. There's no need for trucks to ship or distribute money. There's no need for shredders to shred it or dispose of it. There's no need for security on the building to watch it. I mean, the, the cost for the government is going to drop by like 90% just on transferring from physical currency system to a digital currency system. Now, look, I, I, I don't, I, I love it, but I hate it at the same time, as I mentioned before. If we go to a central bank digital currency, um, your Orwellian fears from 1984 are going to come true because Big Brother is going to be watching you. I mean, they're watching you with your transactions on Venmo, your transactions to the bank. They, they could realistically jump in and spot whatever you're doing. This takes it to a whole nother level. Right, a whole new level if they have a central bank digital currency. For you and me, it'll be simple. No, no more reasons to have dirty hands or get whatever diseases you get from money because it's one of the dirtiest substances on the planet. No need for us to worry about losing our money because it'll all be in an app. You don't have to go, where did I put that $20 bill? Never gonna happen again. You know, open up your phone, you've got your bank account or your Fed account linked directly to that. Your tax returns are paid instantly. Your income is paid instantly. And given digital payments, and the internet of things, you may get paid every day. It'll be automatic with micropayments paying you every day. I mean, this, this, whole, this whole ecosystem could evolve and accommodate new technology, which you know, in some regards benefits you and I. The other side of it is air watching every single thing that you do. And you'll have people kicking and screaming and fighting that one, DK. Um, there's others who just go, I don't care. But I mean, I'm, I'm kind of in the boat of I don't care because I don't do anything illegal. But uh, I still am in the boat of if you're using my data and you're making a ton of money off it, I would like a cut of that. I mean, if Google cut me a check and said, hey, here's 10% of the money we made off of you, I'd actually be using Google a lot more. Uh, give me something. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess you gotta ask, you, Chase says, what's up with the mortgage-backed security portfolio and why did they buy so much in 2020? Are you, are you referring to the Fed? because the Fed's propping up the markets. They're, and they're, the answer to your question, Chase, why? I don't have a freaking clue. I was saying this to my friends a while back, but before 2020, the Fed needs to stop buying mortgage-backed securities. We're in the, one of the most robust housing markets we have ever seen in the history of financial markets, yet the Fed is still buying mortgage-backed securities portfolios, which generally was done to buy the stuff that nobody wanted. Well, maybe they're going into it to buy a profit because they were probably performing rather well. Uh, let's see. Already CBDC is in place in China, India. Yep. Yep. There are several around the world and, and some 
uh, are you know fighting that system. A lot of people don't like the central bank digital currency, but I think it's inevitable. Right? It's just the nature of evolution of financial markets. It's not one of those things I'm going to fight kicking and screaming. I'm just going to you know accept it for what it is. I know it's going to happen. You know, I had a, a good friend of mine, Gary. He actually produced the Power Trading Radio Show for a long time, and actually for ten years. And he actually had me on his show. He had a YouTube channel or a Facebook page, and would do a special on you know central bank digital currencies and the Fed. And when we did it, he goes, "Oh, they'll they'll have it there in six months." I'm like, "No, you're not going to have a central bank digital currency in six months. They've been testing it. They've been deploying it. There already currently are some banks around the world that have implemented a central bank digital currency." I think that the U.S. is probably a couple years out. I would think that by 2025, 2026, it will be implemented. And then I think over the next five or six years after that is the full phase out of physical money altogether. So your stores at some point in the future will no longer take anything. There will be no exchange of money between anybody. So, yeah, that's just a different world. Let's see. Um, Going on to Oliver here. Merlin, do you think all this stuff that happens as cover-up for banks and government to take over crypto... I do, Oliver. Um, I'm currently writing in an article for a bar chart. I tell you, I really struggle with topics to write because I noticed I've written three articles and it's really all about the headline to get people to click on your article and read it. And my article for this week, I have a feeling is going to get not a lot of people to read it just because the title and the title is what do you call a group of black crows? So a group of, you know, black crow event is one of those events that is just so unpredictable, so crazy, comes out of nowhere my argument is we're in a situation right now where we have a, a group of black swans happening. And to Oliver's point, we have a financial crisis. We have a financial situation. And that is used to spread fear in my mind to the general population. And that's also being used to bring in banks that are questionable in the eyes of the FDIC and regulators and bring those in under this fear of Silicon Valley Bank implosion and a financial crisis and say, shut these guys down because they're the ones doing business with crypto. That's going to be Silvergate. That's going to be Signature. These are on-ramps into crypto. They were not in trouble. Silvergate actually was kind of in trouble, but Signature was not in trouble. In, in the statements from FDIC, Signature was seized because of a lack of confidence of management, not because they didn't have funds, not because there was a run on their bank because of any issue. It's because they're a crypto bank and the FDIC tried to bundle that in and now incorporate that and get rid of crypto. So I totally believe, Oliver, that this is not even a cover up. I think that they're kind of being somewhat uh, public about it. They say they aren't trying to shut down crypto, but this is clearly an assault on cryptocurrency, which to our discussion yesterday on Bitcoin, is part of the reason I think you're seeing Bitcoin soar. You're seeing people rush into it and buy more Bitcoin because it's a sign that governments and banks are trying to kick to, to squash it. Therefore, people want that asset. All right, let's see. A super majority of cash is digital only now, not paper bills or coins. Correct. Right, I, absolutely. I mean, most of us really don't use any kind of paper money, but it, it'll be a little bit different because, uh, good point, Tom. I always ask this when I teach a crypto class. I go, how many of you guys are using digital currencies right now? And like one or two people out of a room of 30 will raise their hand. I go, you other 28 don't understand. Every single person in here is using digital currency. Every one of you. Digital currency is a visa. Digital currency is anything that's not physical cash. So you're using an ATM card. You're using a credit card. You know, you're using any wire transfers. That's all digital currency, right? So we still are, we're currently in that model. The difference is this. With a, in the, in the question to Tom here, uh, majority of the cash is digital. Majority of that cash is digital, but where is it being routed through? Visa, MasterCard, Discover Financial Services. It's routed through private companies. So now if, let's say, the government wanted access to the information of who's using their Discover card to buy Beanie Babies on Amazon, they'd have to go and go to Visa, get the information from Visa. Now that power shifts over to the central banks and the banks have all the information. That is the big rub. Not that I like that Visa has my information, but at least it's one, area, one level away from government, not directly in it. So that's, that's the big problem. Uh, yeah, Cash App, Venmo, those are all digital currencies. Yep, absolutely. And it's just, it's, it's kind of interesting to, when you step back and think that we already are accustomed to it. And honestly, <laughs> the vast majority of us like a digital system. I mean, I, I, I always kept cash in my wallet, always as a kid, and I always have it as an emergency, but 
you know, once I learned the importance of credit cards, I use my credit card for everything. Every single thing that I can use my credit card for, I use it without question. I buy a pack of gum for a buck, swipe that card. And usually they look at me like, come on, do you don't have a dollar on you? Anything. Why? Because I'm using free points, free miles. I'm using borrowed money for 30 days for free because I pay my card in full every month. Everybody should be doing that because you build your credit and you get rewards for it. So why not use the system against the institutions? Visa wants you to carry a balance. That's how they get rich. You know, I can go to a loan shark and I can get a 20% loan and that's usurious. 20% loan. Come on, Tony, I got your money right here. I'll break your knees. You don't have to pay me. However, I can hold a balance on Visa and pay 29% interest. That's weird. Visa's like organized crime. MasterCard too. I mean, usurious fees of 29%. That's just horrible stuff. Anyway, <laughs> who got me ranting again? One of you guys started this. I think it was Tom. <laughs> Couldn't the powers that be deny a purchase contrary to the narrative, i.e. Uh, ammunition? Yes. And Jimmy, this is where people are up in arms. Like the way I tied that in there, up in arms, talking about ammunition and guns. Yeah, if you're using the, let's say, and, and this is all hypothetical. I'm just um, hypothesizing about the future. But let's say we have a bank that's uh, an app that's connected to the central banks, right? So this is my central bank wallet. It's, it's 10 years from now. I got no physical cash. Everything goes to that CBDC. And I go, oh, you know what? I want to buy myself a new uh, Colt 45. Home protection. I'm in a, in a rough area of town. I want to have a Colt 45 for protection. That's my, that's my constitutional right. However, I could go there and try to pay with my Fed app and maybe the government says, you know what? We're going to just block transactions of guns at this store or this type of gun or this person. Yes, they could absolutely do that. that that's the only part that really scares me is Big Brother's control over that potential situation. So, you know, I've, I've mentioned this before. I actually, I'm hoarding $100 bills. So I have a nice little stockpile of $100 bills. Why? Because at some point, I think there will be a need to have a black market economy. Things outside of government control, which again, goes back to 1984 by George Orwell. Um, yeah, Jay says, thanks. I, I'm curious when they start to go heavy selling mortgage-backed securities. That's the tough one because if they do, you know, it's going to hurt the housing market. You know, they, they've really done a marvelous job of propping up this market, which I would argue could potentially be another black swan out there, right? They've created that bubble. If you watch the presentation by Darren Komodo at OTA, it's great. He goes, we got a housing market bubble. We have an equity market bubble. we got a bond market bubble. It's like, I got a trifecta of perfect bubbles here. Thank you, Fed, for creating most of them. All right. What else do I got? You guys are active on the chat today. I love it. Uh, couldn't the powers be? Yep, I already got that one. Uh, if Silicon Valley Bank had Bitcoin instead of U.S. bonds, they'd be superheroes now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely would be. Well, you know, twofold there, Tom. Let, let's, be, let's be fair to Silicon Valley Bank and, and to crypto. Like, I don't want to be the, the guy saying crypto is invincible and you just got to buy crypto. That's certainly not the case. So if you look back when Silicon Valley Bank was making those purchases of bonds, that was back in 2020, right? So they were buying these long dated maturities back in 2020 when if they were buying Bitcoin at 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, they'd be heroes. But some of that might have been bought at 60. So, yeah, it, it seems great. But they're, you know, depending on their timing of buying Bitcoin, they might have you know, been hosed. They could have really bought at some pretty bad times uh, and lost a lot of money. So in, in theory, yes, they would look great because here they are in something that's, you know, um, I guess operating much different than a bond market. But a bank, there's no way a, a, a bank, there's no way that the, the Fed would allow a chartered member bank to buy Bitcoin in that kind of quantity, right? The Bank of International Settlements, the BIS, uh, recently issued a report saying that by 2025, banks are allowed to have crypto on their balance sheets and the, the, the structure of what they can hold is very small as a percentage of portfolio. And depending on which layer of crypto it is, um, they can only hold certain percentage in their portfolio. So it's coming. Banks will be allowed at some point in the future to hold it, but uh, I don't think uh, Silicon Valley Bank would have done any favors here by owning a large position of Bitcoin. But let's see. Fed, uh, payment. Fed, now, Fed now CBDC makes payments, Venmo, coin stable, obsolete. I don't think it'll be obsolete right away, but ultimately it does, right? Because if you want to get your money, it's in that Fed account. And, I, and who knows whether they'll allow you to move it to another application. But down the road, you're probably right. You're probably right that those cash apps and things like that will go away. I, I, I think that what we're going to all experience is a great deal of angst and frustration. Some people will just go, fine, no big deal. Others are going to go, you're taking away my freedom. 
you're forcing me to use something to, to purchase. I should be able to use different mediums of exchange, which again is one of the reasons I like crypto because I can now go outside of the ecosystem um, of traditional payment networks. You know, I mentioned this today, I did an XLT general session and in the XLT general session, I talked about, you know, if, if let's say, I'll just look at the past few names here. If DK, Rajesh, Margaret and Tom and I all know each other and we just kind of sending money back and forth. So I pay Tom because, you know, he bought my car or sorry, uh, yeah, I, Tom pays me because he bought my car. Well, he could just pay me $1,000 with a Bitcoin. I don't need to send that anywhere. I have $1,000 worth of barter, if you will. And next thing you know, hey, I want to go buy some food at a restaurant. And that's, uh, let's say it's um, Margaret's restaurant. Great, she's got the best Thai restaurant in town. I go there and Margaret now takes my Bitcoin as payment for food. And let's say she wants to... Um, buy supplies from DK's supply warehouse for her restaurant. And he takes Bitcoin. So you see what I'm saying? We can start to develop this closed loop of, of a digital currency that's outside the mainstream ecosystem of fiat. That, that's kind of what Bitcoin was designed to be, is that peer-to-peer -peer payment network. Now, of course, if you want to get out of that network and say, I need to pay my taxes in dollars, and you're forced to, now I have to find ways to off-ramp that. But you know, at some point, we might have a fully closed ecosystem just of Bitcoin as a, as a global payment network. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. All right. Um, how will banks lend if central bank digital currency is used by the wealthy folks? The Fed can directly give interest on it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that the Fed would not, if you had money in a Fed account, you're probably not going to get interest. So let's say you have a CBDC account. The way I think it would work would be like this. You have your money in a CBDC account with, let's say, the Fed. Now, the Fed has already said they're not going to be the 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 holder of everything. So let's just assume it's Bank of America, but they're now operating just with CBDC. So your money would be sitting at Bank of America. You're probably going to get no interest on it unless you hit a button that says, I'm on an interest bearing account. If you click that interest bearing account, now you know that your money is being lent out and there might be other stuff going on with it. So I think that's going to be an elective thing of what you do with your money. I don't think it'll be an automated payment that's being done. Um, again, that's all future. I don't know exactly what the future holds, but I think it's very interesting because we are in that transition right now. I, I feel like it's going back into 1992 and saying, let's use the internet. People go, what? The internet? I, I don't really know what that is. And then you fast forward to, you know, let's just go to 2020. Everybody's using the internet. Everybody knows what it is. I think that's kind of where we will be, but it's going to take a while for us to get there. Uh, let's see, you guys have a ton of great questions. Uh, what did China do to all their celebrities last year? Mm, I don't know. I don't really follow China too much. Did anyone see the video of Kramer pushing? Oh, yeah. I played that for you guys. I played it on the show. I mean, he gets my donkey of the day. There's, I, You know what I did that, Margaret? I actually, not only did I play the Jim Kramer video of Silicon Valley Bank, but I also played the one he did for Bear Stearns back in 2008. He's like, Bear Stearns is fine. You know, do not sell it. You're, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with Bear Stearns. And like a week later, bankrupt, gone. Same thing with Silicon Valley Bank. So, you know, Jim Cramer, guys. Uh, but by the way, uh, let me go here real quick. Since I've had this thing on me, this this camera on me way too long, I apologize. For the podcasters, you're loving it because you don't have to see my ugly face every day, but uh, the video crew does. Michael said this one in. He says, I cannot believe it, but there is now an inverse Cramer tracker ETF. I told my son it was a joke, but it's actually there at IPO this month. Uh, should it be adding it to the top six? So... It is kind of funny. The ticker symbol is S Jim, so like short Jim. I really love it. Here is S Jim. So by itself, you really can't tell what's going on there, right? You really can't see what what's happening with this. So what I thought I would do is just for fun, I would take the S and P 500 and I would overlay it with Jim Cramer's picks. Well, the inverse of Jim Cramer's picks. You guys ready for that? A little bit of fun. A little, uh, yeah, mock Jim Cramer every chance I get. Why not? So. Let's go look over here. What I've done on this picture here is in red is the inverse Kramer ETF, which is up since the uh, ETF was created, which was what, March 2nd. It started March 2nd, so it's been a month. It's up 2.5%, exactly 2.5% as of today. The S&P 500 is up exactly 0.66%. So if you took Jim Cramer's picks, you would be down 2.5% and the market would be up 0.6%. But you could buy this inverse fund, which does the opposite of that clown, and have been beating the market. So if you did the inverse Jim Cramer ETF, you are beating the market. That just cracks me up. Um, <laughs> I, 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 no more to say about it, guys. It's just, I, 
as someone who's been in this industry for 20 plus years, I just shake my head every time I hear his name because like, how can CNBC allow it? Clearly there's enough people there that watch the show and they get ad revenue from it versus the morality of CNBC to go, hey, listen, this guy's wrong. He's completely the opposite. You know, he's, I, I don't get it. I mean, I, I think he's probably a good guy. I think that he's being influenced. I really do believe that he is being told what to promote by other people and institutions. Remember, he worked for Goldman Sachs. He worked for a hedge fund. So he's got connections all over the place. If I had Jim Cramer as a buddy and I was running a hedge fund, he'd be like, hey, Jim, I got to unload some Apple shares, man. Can you do me, or I, I, I need to, you know, I need to get rid of some Apple shares. Can you do me a favor? Pump Apple tomorrow. And Jim Cramer comes out, buy, buy, buy. You got to buy. It's amazing. Apple's amazing. It shoots up. And of course, you know, now I get to sell all my stuff and I give Jim Cramer a little kickback. Use my house in the Hamptons. Here's a car. Just crazy. Absolutely crazy. Really, but this is proof. You know, you can't argue the fact that he's wrong. <laughs> uh, Tom says, does Kramer ever disclaim that his advice is for short-term scalping or long-term trading? No. Uh, actually, I can't make that claim, Tom, because I don't, I won't watch his show. I just don't do it. There used to be a website, it was called like Jim Kramer Tracker, where you could just watch, it, it would actually um, give you a recap and summary of what he talked about, give you the ticker symbol so you could write those ones down. Underneath it, I believe when he starts the show, there's a giant paragraph of disclaimer. I haven't read it, but I'm pretty sure in there it says, you know, don't take his advice. <laughs> it's it's pretty funny. But uh, yeah, I, I would never, never trade off anything he gives you. Matter of fact, I'd be going the opposite direction most of the time. It's kind of funny because I have been talking about this since I was a trader on the floor back in Southern California. You know, you go back to 1999, 2000, we were all talking about going the opposite of Jim Cramer. And there were reports done. People and analysts, uh, students did report on his picks. And it was funny. Um, I want to say it was like 2003 or 2004. This report that some college kids did, they studied every pick that he made on his show. And out of all of them, they would jump up, right? Normally, normally there's an immediate reaction in the direction that he's saying for it to go. And then within 12 trading sessions, every one of them gave back all the gains. So with that in mind, it's like, okay, I'll wait for Jim Cramer to pump something when it has a big jump. I'll start shorting it and just keep dollar cost averaging the short because ultimately it's going to come back down to where it uh, initially took off from. Kind of crazy. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm sure they track his picks. Look, it's about money. I think you guys all know people that maybe run businesses and they might have an employee that is a total scumbag. It's a liability for them. Could get them into trouble, but they might bring in so much money that you keep that guy around. And I think Jim Cramer is one of those. He's just that name. He's he's mad money. You know, booyah. He's got his own little moniker out there. But ultimately, when you look at this empirical evidence that he is wrong on his picks, and by good margin, you know, um, that he's down 2.5% when the market's up. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. All right. Um, I'm getting long-winded here. I think I answered that question. Um, Todd asked this question. Let me real quickly. I think I need more explanation, Todd. If you could give me uh, elaborate on this one, maybe email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. So can you please elaborate on brokerage margin at some point in the future? I, I think I need to know more about what you're asking uh, with regards to margin. So more detail and I can get you the answer. There's a lot of variables there. Um, another one was this from Tom, who I did not get a chance to get to. Why do I have Bill Addison there? There you go. Uh, this is from Tom. He says, I enjoyed that rut yellow box while it lasted, and I keep referring back to my Bitcoin logarithmic scale all-time chart as its yellow boxes. How would you scan for yellow boxes besides viewing a lot of charts? Any FinViz types of screening that would uh, find it? Second question, rut will form a yellow box again. When will you call it a good yellow box after confirming top and bottom once? Yeah, once I see something start to form a floor and a ceiling and then come back in and not make a new high, that's generally what I'm looking at. So let's go back to the, the Russell here. Just so we can bring up the, uh, I'll bring up the Russell. So I've still kept my box on there. So I think what Tom was using was this. If we were to shrink this box, I think Tom, you were using this one, which we broke it, right? Just tiptoed below it. Still actually in it, right? We didn't close below it. Uh, but I, you could, you could have one there. You could also have one down here. For me, the yellow boxes is just flipping through charts and seeing where I, where I spot things traversing. I don't have any scans or filters like that. So unfortunately, um, you know. It's all just by when I see like that. This was a great example of one. You know, we saw crude oil kind of bounce back and forth. And like right in here, it said, okay, it's starting to reverse sideways. So we'll just draw it on there. And ultimately, it just keeps moving out, moving out, moving out. Um, I, <laughs> wow, Steve. Heckling me. He comes in here late and he's already heckling me. <laughs> um, 
But if you go to Finviz, real quick, let me just show you this as a resource for some of you. You might be able to use, oops, their screeners for it. And you know, you can go through, um, like right here, you got multiple bottom, double top, double bottom. So you could look at those two and, and maybe click on some of these. So let's say multiple bottom, right? Because obviously that's gonna give us a floor. And now I might find something that's gonna be traversing in a range. Now, one thing that you need to know here with, um, with Finviz is they bring up a lot of crap. I mean, a lot of this stuff is just garbage here where you just have, you know, 50 cents. Like I'm not trading a 50 cent stock, sorry. Especially, yeah, no, no, no interest. Uh, I, so I'm real quickly looking to see if any of these give me any ideas. Um, I almost like this one, but it's 70 cents, so forget it. 30 cents, $15. You know, I guess you could argue that AGTI has been bouncing back and forth. So let's go back to this platform, bring up AGTI, right? And then I could just put that basically there and you can see that for the past few months, it's really been stuck in that, that range. So, you know, now maybe there's something on AGTI that I find attractive. I don't even know what this company is. Uh, agility, no idea what they do or how they do it. Doesn't bother me. I just see sideways action here and, um, you know, that's that's where I get the yellow boxes from. So unfortunately, I just, uh, they don't have rectangles on there. You know, it would be nice. I, th I think there was another category if you go to the screener here. I have to go to Finviz Home. You might be able to find something. I haven't dug deep, but there's sideways channel right here. So it's not really a box, but it's just they'll, they'll draw things out there in the channel. Um, unfortunately, what you get are a lot of these bond type of uh, maturity programs, which have this weird like pattern looking chart over and over and over again. So, you know, if you guys want to hold and make 30 cents a month off a $100 security, you just buy this thing as it opens up and rolls over and hopefully make money that way. But you can see here, um, BDRY. BDRY has been sideways for a long time. Great, right? Anyway, um, this might be a resource for you, Tom, is to just look and, and just click on that ch sideways channel. Just remember the price parts. The price becomes a big issue. Like this guy looks like a nice sideways channel. <clears throat> 17 cents, forget it. Um, TLTW, well, again, this is treasury bonds buy right strategy. So this is options on it. So a little bit different. Um, my MYPS, $3, but stuck in a nice range going all the way back into July of last year. I mean, anyway, I could go on and on and on and on. Richard Coffin says, can you take a look at the three-year chart of Boyle and explain how it can drop so much? Yeah, it, it's, it's a leveraged instrument. So it's going to drop more, um, it's a double leverage short. I'm sorry, double leverage long. So what, what that means is, let's go to this chart right here. So let's bring up UNG, which is what it's based off of, and then you can go boil. So whatever we look at, okay, whatever I hit enter here, if natural gas is down 5%, boil should be down 10, right? That, that's just the nature of the beast. If natural gas is up 5%, boil should be up 10, right? It's double UNG. Doesn't work that way. So let me add these two in here. And if I go back to last year, it's like not even remotely close. So natural gas in the last 200 days is down 73%. Boil is down 96%. Well, I guess you can't really go down that much more. But let's go shorter term here. The last 90 days. The last 90 days, natural gas is down 65%. Boil down over 90, 90 something percent. Usually what happens with boil is it's reset every day. So if it drops 5%, it's gonna have to go up 10% the next day just to break even. And because it's been sliding so much, it's just becoming deeper and deeper and deeper into the hole. That's how come it continues to slide like this in the long haul. And we talked about this the other day. You know, if I zoom out here and you look at all these S's at the bottom, there's a, there's a split in 2020, a split in 2018, split in uh, 2000. 15, a split in 2012, those are reverse splits. So split adjusted, split adjusted, if you take those splits out, it's a 300, uh, it's a $39,000 stock, but it'll never get back up there. It's because it's using forward looking futures contracts in UNG, and then it's also a double leverage instrument. So this thing will go down over time. I mean, anything, go short boil and just hold on to it for a decade and you'll probably make pretty good money. <clears throat> Box me using my long-term account today. Yeah, it's dangerous. You know, I'm actually hearing that inventory is full, that the you know the inventory to hold oil, uh, natural gas is full, and therefore the situation that happened in 2020 might be a problem. 
Remember 2020 for oil was no place to store it. It was physical delivery. That's why you saw negative $40 print. So careful, uh, could could these ETFs, or the futures could go negative. I don't think that the ETFs will because the ETFs are always gonna be rolling into the next contract. Uh, but there still could be plenty of downside movement here. My guess is you're gonna see a reverse split for Boyle any day now, probably in the next within the next 30 days. Uh, give me a few more ideas. These filters might help. Now we'll look, at, cool, good, glad to help. All right, let me, um, <laughs> there you go. Let me uh, show you what's happening out there for tomorrow just because this is the, the big day. So tomorrow, obviously, you've got Jerome Powell and the Fed making their rate announcement. My expectation still stands. I've been saying 25 basis points. I think it's going to stay there because the previous one was 25. I can't see them pausing yet. That announcement, as you can see here on the screen, is at 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, sorry, 11 a.m. Pacific time. So that'll be uh, near the middle of the, middle to tail end of the trading session here. If you look at the 1131, that's really the more important part. So you get the rate announcement. That's going to be 25 basis points. If you look at um, the 1130, that's where he makes his press conference. That's where he's going to be out there on camera and they're going to be grilling about him. What about a pause? Why didn't you do 50 basis points? Do you feel the financial crisis is over with? Is it going to have too much? He is going to be lambasted and just grilled from everybody. And I'm, I'm hoping he slips up and screws up because it's always fun when he does do that. He gets flustered sometimes. Uh, he tries to remain calm and composed, but you know he'll crack under pressure if the wrong question comes in. So <laughs> yeah, just don't dollar cost average boil. Oh, you're getting in trouble on that one. Um, so I expect 25 basis points. The real question and, and the crazy volatility, guys, is probably going to happen at 11.30 Pacific time. And that's because you'll get some clarity on, are they going to pause at the next meeting? Now, just so we can look at the, the, the numbers here, the stats, I'll bring that up for you because right now I think, I think it was a 71% chance of a 25 basis point increase tomorrow. I, I think it should be higher than that, but that's fine. Uh, it's jumped to 87 today, right? There you go. So you got 87% uh, chance of a 25 basis point increase. But let's go look at the next meeting, what the anticipation is. So here's the May 3rd meeting, and you can see that the expectations are another 25 basis points then. So we're currently at 4.75. Expectation is we get um, 25 basis points at the next meeting, and then another 25 at the previous at the next meeting in uh, May 3rd. So they're expecting it to continue. I am in that boat. The, the only thing that would um, maybe be all right with me is it's either going to be 25 basis points or pause at the May 3rd meeting, but I do think that for right now anyway, um, they're going to continue to raise. And if the, the economic situation changes within the next you know 30 days before we get to that announcement, then they may pause. But uh, I think it's really determined on what happens with this financial crisis piece and inflation data going forward and unemployment. So a lot of variables are going to be there to, to uh, knock that one out. Anyway, um, Rajesh says, rule, new rule, don't trade uh, leveraged energy ETFs. I would argue be careful with leverage ETFs, period. Remember, a boil is only a double, but you've got triple financials, you've got triple NASDAQ, triple S&P, triple Russells, triple inverse Russells. You know, those leveraged ones, they, are really, they can be really bad. If they're going against you, man, they can be savagely brutal. Um, yeah, savagely brutal. All right, I got to wrap up here, guys. I got to go run and do some errands here before I, my next piece comes up. Uh, I am doing a digital asset session tomorrow morning and then what else do I have yeah we'll do the show tomorrow and then I have my CIL on Thursday and then yeah so I was thinking maybe something else I could promote for myself because I never seem to promote my stuff enough but that's it anyway my uh, my article will be coming out tomorrow we'll probably talk about that in, on tomorrow's show I still have to figure out what I'm going to write I'm just got I've got writer's block I don't have mid journey block I can create images like nobody's business on mid journey but writer's block man that's a tough one Anyway, thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed today's show. It should be a wild one tomorrow. Be really careful. My recommendation, and it's funny, this is why this show is, has nothing to do with Online Trading Academy whatsoever. OTA says, we can't because of the FDIC. You can't use the word, I recommend. Can't say anything like that. I can. I recommend, and I highly encourage you to stay away from that announcement. Don't trade at 11 a.m. tomorrow. You could get absolutely whipsawed and blown apart, and then I would say probably wait till... till the press conference is over and you'll get some clear direction and that volatility will be gone because, man, those things can whip you apart so bad and blow your trade. So just be careful on that one. Anyway, if you guys are new, hit that subscribe button. If you're not new, hit the like button. If you don't like this show, then just simply email me at tradermarone at gmail.com. Tell me what you didn't like or comment down below any YouTube video and I'll put that into tomorrow's show. So th Wednesday will be a wide open show. Give me some topics to talk about and I'll make it happen. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care.